Thank you for tuning in to Season 1 of the Movie Geeks United Art of the Documentary series. In this episode, we're pleased to speak with Gordon Quinn, the director of films including Prisoner of Her Past, A Good Man, and Home for Life, producer of acclaimed documentaries like Hoop Dreams and At the Death House Door, and the artistic director and founding member of Cartemquin Films. For a complete listing of the new and archived interviews that make up season one of this series, visit us online at moviegeeksunited.net. Well, I, I was interested in movies and, you know, narrative films, foreign films, uh, even in high school. And then when I went to the University of Chicago, I saw some of the early Verite films. I saw, you know, Sales Bun by Albert Maisel, and I saw Happy Mother's Day by Ricky Leacock and Joyce Chopra. And that's really what drew me into this field, uh, telling stories about real people. Uh, and, you know, we, when I, I studied the literature and philosophy at the University of Chicago, they didn't really have any film production there then. Uh, although they do now, they have a very, a very good program. And um, when I got up out of college uh, with my friends from college, Jerry Temner and Stan Carter, we started Kartemkin. Uh We thought it sounded like the Russian movie Potemkin. We were soon joined by uh, Jerry Blumenthal, also from the University of Chicago, who became my producing partner for many, many years. He just passed away last year. Uh, but we weren't going to change the name to Cartemplin Ball at that point. So, and we've evolved over the years. So, uh, you know, partly why I think we survived. We we changed with the times. I wanted to know Chicago at that period of time that you attended university. Uh, I would think early early to mid '60s, uh, and started yeah. started the organization. What? Stories did you see around you that uh, that were uniquely suited uh, for, to be covered in documentary form? Uh, you know, in the in the early days, I've, I've uh, talked. I'm at the Houston Cinema Arts Festival right now, where they're hmm. showing several Cartemquin films and sort of honoring us. And one of the questions I've been getting from people here in Houston is people concerned about you know. Why did we stay in Chicago, and can you really have, you know, a regional center of filmmaking? And I think that very early on we made that decision that we were going to stay in Chicago. We were, even though our funding sources were often coming from, you know, New York, Boston, uh, sometimes Los Angeles, we felt that the, you know, America needs regional filmmaking. It needs stories you tend to find the stories where you are. So even though we've made films all over the world now, I would say that the, the majority of our films are about subjects that are set in the Midwest. And that's, you know, it's important in a democracy that all parts of the country are participating in, in telling their stories. And now, of course, Chicago is a much more vibrant uh, and much more, uh, it's much easier for us to exist as a media organization and those regional stories, I mean, they're they're kind of microcosms that have relevance to to everywhere else on on the planet. So, it's it's not like you have to live in Chicago to fully understand and appreciate the topic. No, that you're no, there we we used to have some tagline or something. You know, I think we retired it, but you know, that said we're we're bringing uh, midwestern stories to a national and international audience. You know, we sell our work. Uh, foreign broadcasters a lot. Hoop Dreams was an enormous success internationally. It's a totally Chicago story. It's Chicago neighborhoods. It's Chicago young people, uh, you know. But the, the themes of coming of age, of, you know, having a dream around sports, uh, of family drama and dynamics, that's all universal. Yeah, yeah. What are the, I mean, obviously you've been doing this for, Fifty, around fifty years. Um, yeah, next year. What, next year is our fiftieth year, which is astounding. It, it, nice. It's just a, a yeah. remarkable achievement. Um, but something has to keep you in this field. What 
evidence have you seen that documentaries have the power to provoke change? <clears throat> well, I think that you know different kinds of documentaries work in different ways, but we have always felt that by engaging people emotionally, you can open them up, and they may be looking, you know, at people's stories that aren't like them or that they're not even sympathetic with. But if you can engage them emotionally, you can begin to open them up to seeing something from somebody else's point of view. I mean, Hoop Dreams is a wonderful example of that. A great number of people saw Hoop Dreams who would never watch a film about, quote, inner city families, who would never watch a film about a social problem or a social issue. But they saw hoop dreams because of the uni universal themes that it, it contained. It was about sports and basketball and family drama and coming of age. And so that's what we look for uh, in whatever film we're showing here. I mean, uh, one of the films that we showed here, Almost There, a new film that's going to be in theaters uh, shortly, uh, and then eventually will be uh, will be on television. But uh, it's it's about an outsider ar artist. It's a guy who is a hermit. Uh, the film takes a very unexpected change right in the middle of it, and but at the end, surprisingly enough, I mean, it's a story that. In the middle of it, it was a pretty dark story, and we thought, oh, my God, what kind of, you know, where's this going to wind up? But, in fact, surprisingly, it wound up in a pretty good place. And that's partly what keeps me, in, you know, engaged, is that documentary is out in the real world. Uh, whatever it is, I just, my last big film about the choreographer, Bill T. Jones, you know, one of the most important uh, modern dance companies in, in the U.S. today, it's like I was in the world of dance for a couple of years, you know. I'd never been to a dance performance virtually, you know, but all of a sudden I'm immersed in this other culture that I have to make sense of and begin to understand, and that's what I love about documentaries. It's, it's always taking you somewhere different. You never quite know where the story is going to go uh, mm -hmm. and how it's going to work out. That's what's so terribly exciting to me, too, as a viewer of the documentary form, because just by the very nature of the process of putting one together, you can have one idea of what it might be when you start out, but could end up a completely different place by the film's end. And the excitement from a viewer standpoint is to see that transformation happen right before your eyes. Uh, so in terms of when you, when you embark on a project, uh, tell me the importance of kind of keeping an open mind to to what may come at you, and 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 not uh, cementing yourself to a particular theme or notion of what the film should be. Yeah, I mean, I think that's you know that's kind of a our template trademark. Our, our films uh, on the surface could look very different from each other depending upon what they're about. Uh, we, you know, and we work with many different filmmakers who take different approaches. But one of the things that's really important with the people that we work with, what we're interested in, is someone who is willing to go where the story takes them. And sometimes it takes them in unexpected places. In a film like Almost There, the filmmakers were in the film in a minor way, but they're really documenting this guy's life. And by the end of the film, they're very much a part of the story. They've been dragged in. Uh, to their own story in some unexpected ways. And so, you know, I mean, when we do something, when we did The New Americans about immigration, uh, we do an enormous amount of research. We, you know, had filing cabinets full of stuff that we had gathered and stuff that we would, you know, giving ourselves a background in the area. But the reality is the families that we store and followed and what happens in those stories is going to be determined by how life unfolds, and we had to be prepared to go wherever it took us. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, I think sometimes people set out with a, a kind of preconceived idea. They're going to sort of show something in a particular way. And, you know, those are some of those are great documentaries, but that's not what we do. We, 
we really start with that kind of open-ended curiosity about what's going on here, what's going to happen, how will the story unfold. And then as we shape the story, as we make the film, what we're trying to do is be true to that story, but craft it in a way that can move people emotionally. We do want to draw them in to the story. Yeah. Whatever. And a big, a big part of the... I mean, it's the same in narrative, narrative film as well. You're after truth. Uh, yeah. A big, a big part of that is being empathetic yet unflinching. Um, and, you know, I, I watch certain films, uh, and, and, you know, I was watching something like Har- Harlan County uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there's a yeah, scene in that film, film where... Yeah. yeah, wonderful. And there's a scene in that movie that's absolutely wrenching where the mother of someone who was slain at his viewing essentially passes out from grief. And I was thinking to myself, the dynamic of, you know that you, you have to keep your camera in that moment. And yet the, the sensitivity of, for just from a human standpoint of wanting to kind of look away because it's so painful, but the, the job of a documentarian is to not look away, to put the camera front and center covering that kind of, Motion and event it, it, that that must be kind of a challenging dynamic for the documentary filmmaker. Well, it is. You know, you mentioned Harlan County, Barbara Koppel's uh, great film, which of course was influenced us, and, and we've been friends with here. I, I told her once. I said I've only one, written one uh, fan letter in my life, Barbara, and it was after I saw Harlan County. I wrote you a letter, a handwritten letter, uh, you know, sent by snail mail. This is a long time ago. Uh, and, you know, there's an inc- another incredible moment in that film where you see the, the sheriff or whatever he is point the gun right at the camera, you know, yeah. and, and you hear her voice from behind the camera, or she's probably doing audio, saying, don't shoot, don't shoot, you know. And I think that it's in the film, you know. We, uh, you know, in the world that we in, live in, we try to be transparent about the fact that we are making a movie and to let the audience understand that we are there, that we are a part of the situation. We don't try to hide that. Well, the other, I mean, I, I know that you're, you've, uh, you you in, in, engage in all sorts of various forms of documentary, all approaches and techniques, but having started out... Uh, Strictly focused on the the verite style. Mm-hmm. Um, by its very nature, as soon as you frame uh, a shot or the the cutting, the rhythmic cutting that you engage in in the editing room, you're you're I- I- imposing a certain point of view on your subject. Um, Absolutely. So tell me about. The that process to maintain a sense of <coughs> of truth and observation when you can easily manipulate it in the editing room. Right. Well, it's you know it, it, there's this misunderstanding, and you know people like to say, oh, you know the verite filmmakers they claim, you know it's an unfortunate translation from the French, you know, cinema of truth. They're claiming some kind of special objectivity, and nobody ever claims. You know, just as you said, as soon as you frame the shot, as soon as you make a single edit, you've created a point of view. The camera's pointing one way and not another. That's a choice. Um, And for, but you know, you mentioned narrative filmmaking. Uh, You look at some narratives and you say, "Man, that's a powerful film. It really, it's true." You know, you feel it's true. And you look at other narrative films and you say, "That's bullshit." Uh, and the same is true with documentary. I mean, it's you. The truth lies with the integrity of the maker. Uh, and you know, if the if the maker does not have that integrity to be, you know, honest with what they're struggling with, then it's it's, it's not going to be true, even if everything in every is real life. You know, we have this phenomenon called reality. TV, you know, and it's like, mm. give me a break. That's not, uh, you know, that's just a joke. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do you see a, a, a parallel between 
the the periods of time when the documentary form thrives and the un, the general sense of unrest in the world well i think uh i think documentary i was on the radio uh, here at Houston this morning talking about the fact that i think that documentary is incredibly important to a democracy um you know having diverse voices and different people's stories and, you know, embracing the diversity of the country that we actually are. And those stories are an essential part of the democratic process. And so there's always a place for documentary. In, you know, times of unrest, they become even more important to provide, you know, a voice and an emotional connection to what's going on. Uh, you know, I the the philosopher John Dewey uh was what really got me thinking about this at the same time that I was seeing these early documentary films that I mentioned. I was writing my BA paper about cinema verite in a democracy and one of the founding statements, uh principles of that paper is John Dewey's quote, which I'll mangle for you, but you can look it up. It's from the public and its problems. Uh, and he says, you know, artists have always been the real purveyors of the news because it's not the outward happening itself which is new, but the engendering of it, of appreciation, emotion, and perception. So it's, you know, that's to say it's not, the facts that are so important. What's important is how do they make you feel? How does it? Mm. How does a viewer respond to that in some kind of emotional or perceptual way, where they're now seeing things from a different perspective? And that's you know that's an essential part of a, of a document documentary. And that's why I think the documentaries are so important to the overall process of our democracy, and that there needs to be a space for them. You know. Very concerned when I see, you know, documentary. You know, the outlets for documentary to meet, reach a mass audience as they do, you know, on this series, Independent Lens and POV, which appear on public television, uh, threatened in some kind of way. Mm. That's why, uh, through my entire career, I've been a bit of a media activist. You know, getting involved to try and protect the space for people to tell those kind of stories, the kinds of stories that we saw in a film like, like Harlan County. Well, you know, and it's, it's something that we discuss quite a bit on the show because in many respects, given the social media platforms of today, we're, we are more connected than ever before, but in another sense, we're more disconnected than ever. And so I find that the documentary form especially uh, gives us a chance to 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 reconnect with with the world outside and uh, understand and and empathize in a very special profound way. Um, when you talk about the 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 current climate of documentary filmmaking and all the delivery services out there, mm -hmm. do you are you generally very excited? about this movement? I mean, do you feel that documentary is in a is in a great place currently? Well, I think it's in a, it's in a, there's a lot happening. I think it's in a good place. But I also think there's this tendency of people to say, well, you know, the technology is all changing and everybody can edit on their laptop now and you know, you can shoot a film with your with your iPhone and blah 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 and for me, you know, my least favorite question in a Q and A is, "What camera did you use?" It's not about the camera. And on this radio thing I was on this morning, there was a guy there from Access Cable, and I was making the point that you know, it's yes, the the technology is more accessible than it was, but in the '60s we were scrappily little, you know, we were political artists. We had no money. We had no backing. We managed to get cameras. We managed to get some films. We managed to kind of make some films and tell some stories. It's a lot easier now. But what's just as hard is 
how do you get the resources to be paid to spend a year in an editing room crafting a real story? How do you get the resources to spend four and a half years like the guys who make Hoop Dreams did, you know, staying in these boys' lives and following the arc of the story over time? It's like those, are, those things don't go away. And, there, you know, we need places like cable access centers. We need places like media arts centers where people come together in a collegial atmosphere and can learn their craft. And their craft is not which buttons to push, you know, on the editing machine or how to turn the, the camera on or, you know. The craft is how to tell a story, how to make something have an emotional impact, how to be, we were talking about truth earlier, how to make a story to make a piece that people look at it and, and they feel it in their gut. They say, that's true, that's real, that's something I can connect to. That's the craft. Mm. Yeah, and and I and I love it how you how, how you specified that you know fact is different from tr- truth uh, many times. I mean, truth yes. comes from the yeah. the experience of of it. Uh, with the there's a, there's a trend in documentary filmmaking that I think I believe I find disturbing. Uh, and I, I don't know if you feel the same way, it, it, where the documentarian uh, seems determined to make themselves the star of, of the film more than the subject. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it, it, do you see that happening more and more, and, and is that um, part of the fa- fabric, or are you concerned by it? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm really concerned about it. I think there are different kinds of documentaries, so... You know, uh, Michael Moore is in his films. He's kind of the star of his films. We don't make films like Michael Michael's films, but I enjoy them. I go to see them. I often walk out of a Michael Moore soap film and I say, boy, I needed that. You know, I needed the humor and that kind of thing. I think the question of the role of the filmmaker within the film, you know, Steve James, in, in Hoop Dreams you hear... Steve James's voice asking a few questions of the characters, and he's barely there. But in other films, like Stevie, uh, and in No Crossover about Alan Iverson, he's drawn much more fully into the film, sometimes against his will, but it's just what the story demands, you know? Mm-hmm. And so in this film that we showed here, Almost There, uh, actually, two, the film, two show films we showed here, Gallup is a good example. Gallup was a film about an artist that I was doing with Jerry uh, Blumenthal, uh, my co-director, and Judy Hoffman, the associate producer. And in one way or another, tiny ways, we all appear in the film because we're dragged into it. Uh, there's a moment when Golub is painting a guy's tongue, and he's like, he's like, Jerry's standing right by him recording sound, and he turns to Jerry and he says, Stick your tongue out. I want to see the color. I want to see what that is. And the, I wide the camera out so Jerry's in the shot with his boom, with his microphone. You know, we're we're transparent about that. There's another scene where in the background Judy Hoffman's taking a picture, and it, and another minor moment. These are all minor things in the film. We just we don't make any of them. They just happen. Uh, he's sent his assistant out to get him some water guns because he's going to draw a pistol and he wants to look at the shape. And he borrowed the money from me. And when he comes back, there's this little business of, you know, him giving me back the money that he owed me. And you see my hand actually come out from behind the camera to, to take the money. And we include that in the film to just, in a very minor way, give the audience a sense of the filmmaker's relationship to their subject. We want to be transparent about that. But in Almost There, the other film we showed here, the filmmakers think they're going to play a minor role. You see them interacting with their subject. You see them asking them a few questions. But they think they're going to be minor. You know, it's going to be similar to that. But as the film unfolds, some unexpected things happen, and a crisis erupts, and there's a real confrontation at one point between the filmmakers and the subject. And they, you know, they became characters in their own film because of what happened. So I don't, I don't have a problem with filmmakers uh, 
appearing in their own films. In our case, it's usually something that happens after we've started the process and the filmmaker is kind of drawn into the film, uh, sometimes unwillingly. Uh, but I think that, you know, there is this, uh, you know, who, who's in the foreground is often an important question that, that we'll ask. And I know several times in the editing rooms I've been working with filmmakers and there'll be, you know, there will be a character, you know, we, we did a film about homeless youth uh, that's out there now uh, with two women out of New York. It's called The Home Stretch. And in the film, there are very important secondary characters who are part of the social safety net that enables these, are afraid social safety net that enable these kids to have a chance. There are, there are kids going to high school who are homeless. But we don't want them in the foreground. We want the kids to be in the foreground and these other characters are in the background. So sometimes it's tricky to find that balance between, mm -hmm. you know, the people whose story it really is and other people who kind of mediate the story in some kind of major way. And we, we struggle with those kind of questions a lot. Yeah. I, I just have a couple more very quick questions for you, and then, then I'll let you off the hook. Um, you know, you, you have such an impressive list of directorial credits, but y your your work as a producer is also equally impressive. Sure. And I want to know the, the role of the documentary producer. I want to know the specific challenges you have to uh, facilitate an environment in which the filmmaker can can do their best right. work. Well, there, there are two aspects of producing, and I'm primarily now in, involved in the creative side. Uh, the other side, which is incredibly important, is the deal making, raising the money, you know, actually getting the resources to make the film. Uh, producers also play a role in getting new releases and, and getting access sometimes to the story, working with the director to make sure that they can actually, you can actually tell the story that you're trying to tell. But on my side of it, I work more in the editing rooms. I work with the, uh, with the directors around like maybe some ethical questions that come up around their film and how they're going to solve those kinds of problems. Uh, and things like that. But a lot of it is, you know, giving them advice as they go out into the field, but I actually don't go out into the field with them unless I'm directing. Uh, sometimes with a new, sometimes with a first-time director, I will act as their cameraman for the first part of the film. That was something I did on In the Family, uh, Joanna Rudnick's film uh, about the BRCA breast cancer gene. You know, and I shot you know, sort of the early parts of the film with her, uh, but then gradually she started working with uh, women camera people that we work with and, uh, you know, really then didn't get involved again until we were actually editing the film and shaping it. So, you know, the producer does a lot of different kinds of things on a documentary. I find documentary filmmaking a very collaborative process, and that's the way I like to approach it. Uh, and when I'm director, I usually, you know, I'm, I'm working with, if someone else is producing it, I'm working with a producer who is really collaborating through the whole process creatively and in terms of the, the, deal, the deal making and the fundraising. Yeah. Are you still working on 63 Boycott? Uh, I am. You know, we, that something I shot back in 1963 when I was a student at the University of Chicago about the largest uh, northern boycott of, of, of the schools. And the history's never been told. It, it, I offered the Buddhist eyes and the prize, and uh, they never took it. And so we, I wanted it done for the 50th anniversary in, uh, you know, in, in 63, 2013. But it wasn't done. But what we did do is we had a 20-minute version. I, ultimately, it's going to be about a half-hour film. It's not going to be one of our epics. But we had a big event at the DuSable Museum, and we showed that 20-minute version. And once I did that, the film is, you know, we live in a digital age now. And so the film is out in the world, 
And so we just let people use it. Anybody who wants to use it, they contact us, so we make it available for them for events and stuff. But I do want people to come to the website, 63boycott.com, uh, because I'm looking for people, some of whom are scattered across the country, who may have appeared in the footage that, that I shot, and we have 500 stills taken from the footage on the website, and it's, you know, they're like, uh, it's like Facebook. You can click on the picture, and you can leave us a note, tell us who you are and how to contact you, you know, and I'm trying to get people to identify themselves in the footage. Mm -hmm. And we found a few people that way to interview. Uh, and then I, I've i already talked to all the major leaders of the boycott, and in, many of them are in this 20-minute piece that we have, uh, you know, either woven with the, the actual boycott footage, and then we'll uh, hopefully finish the film uh, next year. And that, and that website is what again? 63boycott, E-O-I-C-O-T-T, dot com. Okay. Well, that's easy enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, 53boycott.com. Uh, uh, my last question for you, uh, if if you were to teach a class to film students on the documentary form, um, and you can use some of your own titles as examples, what particular scenes or titles would you show to illuminate various lessons? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I often take, I, I work with clips a lot, you know, I do, I don't actually, I, I, I'm not a teacher, but I'm often in somebody's class or I'm giving a master class somewhere, and I use clips from Hoop Dreams, I use clips from Stevie, uh, the film I did with Steve James, I use clips from the New Americans, the seven-hour series that we did uh, mm -hmm. on immigration, um, and often what I'm looking for in those clips is something that I can show that makes that people in the class feel something or see how <clears throat> we push something together. I have two clips that I love. I show them all the time. One is, uh, they're both from the New Americans, and they're very short. What I love about them is it's a very short clip. I have a clip that I use from, from Hoop Dreams a lot, but it's longer. It's like, you know, two and a half minutes. One of these clips is, is under 90 seconds, and it's, the little six-year-old boy or eight-year-old boy, he sang goodbye to his schoolmates and his school and his teacher in this very rural part of Mexico. There's a dirt floor on the school, and he's, he's sort of cheerful, and then he kind of just walks out the door. He's walking into the, to the light, you know, in the doorway uh, after embracing his teacher and saying, thank you, you taught me to read, you know. And see, they have this emotional moment. And then it's just his head is down, he's all slumped over, he's totally dejected, and he walks into the light, blown out doorway, you know, and kind of disappears into it, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like he's going to America and he's not happy about it. And what I love about that 90 seconds is it's emotional, it draws you in. You, I, I, I say to students, it's like people will sigh, you know, you'll hear a little... Uh, response from the audience, you know, it's like, oh, and I'm said, that's what I'm going for. It's that noise that you all made. That's, that tells me that this scene is working. And the scene is very complicated and layered. You're learning many things. You're learning that this boy who's coming to America is giving something incredibly valuable up. He's leaving. This is a good school, even though it's very poor in a very poor area. This is a good teacher, and he loves her, and he's done, she's done something for him. She's taught him to read and write, and he's aware of that. And it was one of the core messages of this seven-hour series. It was something that came up again and again and again, which is that people who come to America are giving up something of incredible value to them in terms of their culture and everything that they know. It's not like everybody's thrilled to be coming to America. They often have to. There's other things. And then the other scene that I show from the New Americans is from the uh, Palestinian story. It's a young Palestinian woman. Uh, she feels that she has no future in Palestine. <clears throat> she feels very black there. But she's fallen in love with a, a cousin of hers who's a Palestinian-American uh, living in, born in Chicago. And 
she's going to come to America, but she has to finish. One of the things that was important to us is she has to finish college in Jerusalem. She's at Al-Quds University. And so we filmed her going to school and finishing up, you know, her college career. So you can get a sense of her life in the culture where she is the sophisticated one, where she knows every nuance of the culture. Finally, she gets to America, and I have this 30-second scene where her husband is teaching her to drive at night. God knows why he was teaching her to drive at night. And they're, they're driving in the car, and the camera, I have the camera mounted on the dashboard. I, I'm really sick of all these documentaries where you see, you know, the camera in the back seat filming the people in the front seat over their shoulder. I keep saying to people, hey, you know, this is where technology does make a difference. You, you've all got GoPros. Put the camera, you know, let me see their faces. So I, I, this was before the GoPro. I went to a lot of trouble to mount the camera so I could see them. And they're, they're, it's 30 seconds. They're driving along, and he goes, you know, like, stop, stop. And she slams on the brakes, and she stops. And she said, why did you tell me to stop? And he says, well, a, a kid could run out in front of the car. And, and you know, you would, you would have to stop in a hurry. And she gives him this look, and now they shift into Arabic. And she's saying to him in Arabic, why don't you run out in front of the car and see if I can stop? You know, and it's a big laugh. It's a big gender laugh. All the women laugh. And, again, it's a way, it's a scene in which there's many things going on, but one of the things that you're seeing is that certain things about relationships between uh, couples are kind of universal. You know, mm -hmm. any culture, anywhere, everyone knows what's going on there. And, you know, I love those two clips.